morning, everybody. How are we doing, Sam at United People's TV? I think it's fair to say that today is going to be a pretty interesting show. I think it's fair to say that the comments are going to be pretty interesting, probably quite spicy. We're going to be speaking about Sheikh Jassim, I imagine, for the last time on this channel. That's a good thing, because it's been a seriously long, what was it, 14, 13? So I don't know how many months it's been now. 14 months since November. I can't be bothered to do the maths. But new documents released yesterday. And can I stress this a lot at the beginning of this show? Legal documents were released yesterday to the New York Stock Exchange by the Security and Exchanges Commission, uh, detailing a lot more information around the takeover. Now, I'm going to run through quite a few of the headlines. I'm going to run through some of the details around Sheikh Jassim's Qatari bid, which looks like nothing more than a farce, right? I'm going to run through the details of that, and we can discuss it here as a community this morning. And yesterday was just, my word, it was stories and news coming out of absolutely every area because it was Jim Ratcliffe's tender offer that was released, and more information came out about that. Um, then we've got the... Uh, the latest filing to the SEC Security and Exchange Commission. More of the information coming out about that. Manchester United's first quarterly financial results came out. United posting another loss despite record revenues. Again, we'll run through that. Anthony Martial has been in exile from training because he's not fit enough. I'm like, imagine my surprise. We'll speak about that. And there's going to be plenty more. Who's here from the member gang? Who's here from, just if you're a regular viewer, welcome aboard too. But who's here for the member gang? So have a look. Brian, Carl, good morning to both of you. Mazid, we've got John, Stephanie, Lee, Sandman, Kerwin. We've got um, Lee Southam. We've got Skinny G. We've got um, Bully, Teclom, Lind Green, Kieran, and Connor. And Josh, I can see there as well. Mark, you're there too. William and and, and Stephanie. Lane. There's so many names. There's so many of you. Look, welcome aboard. Who's here on Facebook? Edred, good morning to you. Mark Fossey, all the regulars tuning in. Musa. We've got uh, Richard Thomas, Stephen Lawrence, and Mark Henry. Can I just say to kick off this morning? <sighs> I swear it's like minus five degrees out there right now for where I am. Jeez. I had to put heating on this morning. Don't worry, ladies and gents. I turned a couple of the radiators. I literally got a message from my dad after that live show yesterday. He goes, Sam, what we've got to do is turn the radiator valves off. And I'm like, I, I, I knew that. But I couldn't be bothered to turn those ones off because then when I want to turn the heating on everywhere, I've got to go and turn them all back on. I don't want to do that twice a day. Anyway, it's cold out there. <laughs> it is cold out there. Jeez. But I'll tell you what. It's, um, we have been, throughout this entire process, okay? Throughout this entire process, we have been starved of, information that's the main thing that we've been missing there's been speculation galore and i tried my hardest throughout this whole process to try and decipher what was information what was fact what was um and what wasn't what was something that was being pushed by one side and it was an extremely difficult thing to go through and i've spoke about this at quite a lot of length and detail before like even some like really established and high profile journalists got burnt throughout this whole process and it wasn't necessarily their fault it's just that man there's been a lot of smoke and mirrors throughout everything and with the Sheikh Jassim bid I think it was if I remember correctly it was like mid-October the Sheikh Jassim pulled out. And some people were like, oh, I've told you, Mark Goldbridge literally said this is Manchester United are finished as a football club. That sentence will stick with me. I don't think I'll ever um, forget that sentence. And now, there's more evidence coming out around the Qatari takeover 
And I put that in inverted commas. Because they were nothing more than charlatans. Sheikh Jassim, Thomas Ziliakis, Michael Knighton. They can all go and have a little party together. Uh, we'll do a little poll. Who was the biggest charlatan out of them all? What I'm going to do is run through some of the details here, okay? Uh, before I, I, I'm really interested to hear your sort of takes on this in the comments, and I will go down there after, all right? I want to read this out. Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani's Qatari bid for Manchester United never once provided evidence of the source or proof of its funding, according to new documents on the club's strategic review process. Now, what documents are they, I hear you say? This document. Anybody wants to read it? No, you don't. You really don't want to read it. This is a long, old document which is released to the New York Stock Exchange because Manchester United are a New York Stock Exchange listed company. So there are rules and regulations, right? Who are the Securities and Exchange Commission? Can we say this first? This will make you laugh. Or maybe it won't make you laugh. The federal, right? The federal securities, <laughs> just look at this. <laughs> the Security and Exchanges Commission has up to five commissioners appointed by the president on the advice and consent of the Senate, all right? <laughs> We're talking about federal law here. U.S. federal law appointed by the president on the advice and consent of the Senate. And this here, from Mark Goldberg yesterday, it's the first time I've ever actually called something that I've seen of him say, on Twitter, I've called it out. Do you know how fucking stupid that is? You are calling a document released with legal ramifications PR spin. Now I've I've mentioned this concept of what PR like this spins, but I, and I'm pretty sure it it, just, it feels like it's Goldbridge and um, United Stand followers. I I've, I've I sit by and I have sat by and sort of silence so often, but like sod that. That is an insane take. So so what Mark Goldbridge is suggesting there is that a a full filing to the Security and Exchange Commission that is bound by federal US law was manipulated and published by the Glazers as spin. <laughs> It's just, I usually won't comment on it, but he influences so many United fans that that's just a really dangerous take. You can argue about opinions and everyone, everyone's got different opinions and I, I won't disagree with, look, we all sort of, diff, uh, sort of um, argue about our opinions here, but that's just madness pure madness and yeah it's um it's i mean it's not really funny if i'm honest that all this process the whole way through here the qataris never provided evidence of the source or proof of funding Throughout the entire process, every time that the rain group asked the Glazers, and by the way, there's a lot more information on this, but I'm going to do a lunchtime video on this today because I'm not sure it's completely, I'm not saying it's not inappropriate for a live show, but there's so much kind of hard to get your head around. 
So I'm going to do it in more of a concise video at lunchtime today. We're just going to go with the top lines here and I'll go into more detail at lunchtime. Stephen, you're saying oh, that rise above 100. Look, I have this entire time. You know full well that I've never sort of picked any. And I'm not I'm not picking fights here. But come the fuck on. The concept of labeling a legal document a spin because you don't like what it says. Be better. Be better. And this is um <sighs> kind of all been strung along this whole way through, haven't we? Now, of course, this is coming out here uh, and Ben Jacobs. And look, I spoke to Ben Jacobs a few times here on United People's TV. It, it, it was obvious that Ben did have links close to the Qatari bid, which is why I, I enjoyed the conversations we had with Ben. I think we came on for maybe four, maybe five, um, five times we had interviews on here. I haven't spoken to him recently. I still speak to him behind the scenes. But he is quoting a source close to the Sheikh Jassim bid saying that they are arguing against that legal document. They are saying, now hold up. You're missing some key facts. I'm not seeing that reported in The Athletic, in The Times, in the BBC in the telegraph I, i've just seen this from ben jacobs so i'll be any i'll be interested to um see what comes next from this and again i'm going down here and i'm going to be speaking some reading some of your comments but i need to pull this one up because i think it's just an extension of what i'm trying to say here it's funny how you want to believe whatever the glazers put out knowing how crafty they are in the business world Chris, and this is what I'm trying to educate United fans on. Dude, this isn't the business world. This is the legal world. This is not a business document. This is a legal document. This is, this is something I don't think United, some United fans are sort of getting their heads around, which is why I'm speaking about it here. <laughs> you can make up anything you want. You can't make that up. That isn't something that the Glazers have just hired some writers to write. It's a legal document. This, this, is, the, this, is, this is the thing that we are not arguing against uh, reports in papers here, people. <laughs> we are arguing against something which is legally submitted and has ramifications. Get your head around it. And it's, that, that's what I'm trying to sort of say here and speak about this morning. Uh, Jibak, you're saying, look, irony is everything from Goldbridge's pretend name to pretty much everything he peddles of propaganda and spin. Everything he does is self-serving. <sighs> no, I've Mark Goldbridge has got an incredible work rate, and he he knows his position as an entertainer, and he entertains a lot of people. But a lot of what he does and says is something that I would not do on this channel, and we are different. And how we cover Manchester United will always be different. Yeah. Um, just different strokes, different folks, I suppose. But yeah, uh, let's see if anything comes from this. Let's see if anything comes from the fact that, I mean, look, Sheikh Jassim's bid team are seeking a corrective statement. Where's a statement from their, their team? Where is that statement, as I said, on BBC, on Telegraph, on Times, on, on everywhere else? It is um it, it's just with Ben at this moment in time. Uh, and I think this is this is just gonna fizzle out. I don't think there'll be any corrective statement. And I don't think there should be either. Multiple times throughout this process, they were asked to prove their source of funds. And they never did. And do you want to know on top of this as well? We heard so many times about the power of the Qataris, the power of Sheikh Jassim, the money that they've got. 
and we have again for the first time facts and figures it has emerged that the Glazers gave Sheikh Jassim the opportunity to buy United in May last year for $5.76 billion, excluding the club's existing debt, which is a significant amount more. But that right there is, 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 is the figure. We, we have on this channel umdenard and tried to um, decipher how much the bids were and, and how much United would actually sell for right there in that document, legal document, $5.76 billion. That was the price that the Glazers were willing to sell Manchester United for. Now, you obviously have to add on top of that uh, debt and liabilities, which is actually north of $1 billion right now, which I'll speak about in a little bit. But that is how much they needed to pay and they didn't offer it now in my lunchtime video i'm going to sort of i'm going to explain to you in a bit more detail the timeline of what happened when the bids went in from Sheikh Jassim, what they were worth and the conversations that happened there and what happened with jim ratcliffe but this dude looking like nothing more than a charlatan right that's what this all this information is coming out now is showing. And I I, th I, I wonder actually I want to ask you this in the comments. Throughout this entire process, I'm really I'm really interested to see the, these comments actually. How do you feel I covered the takeover? Was I somebody who who tried to sort of see both sides of the coin? Or do you you feel I always wanted um, it to be Ratcliffe or I always wanted it to be Sheikh Jassim? Because I always, uh, uh, there was always a big part of me that was so anti-Qatari because of my disdain towards state ownership inside the Premier League. Or just like, well, not just state ownership, but Roman Abramovich at Chelsea, big, oh, I suppose it coming from, well, just, Big foreign owners. I mean, that nah, nah, sounds like Nigel Farage saying that. Foreign owners in our country. That's not what I mean. But states and former oligarchs using Premier League clubs as their sort of play toy and way to just kind of wash their money. And that's why I was part, part of me was always fundamentally against any sort of Qatari takeover. But at the same time, I try to see the benefits of it. Because I remember when the Ratcliffe story came out about him keeping the Glazers in. I remember that first stream. I was like, oh, shit. I didn't know. I didn't know what to think. Let me see what you're saying, Dan. I'm interested to get your feedback on this, actually. Um, uh, Simi Skim, you're saying I was a bit wishy-washy. Hey, dude. You kind of, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, and you're saying you were so on the fence, you could have been. Saying, <laughs> it feels like I, it felt like the, the, the fairest way to do it because I honestly, up until, sorry, wrong, I don't, wow, I just accidentally pulled a comment up there. Um, it felt like throughout this entire process, um, I didn't really have much confidence on which side it was going to right up until the end when the Qatar is pulled out I, I still didn't know which way it would swing so I couldn't categorically rule out either side um there's a super chat there from Akash let me see that the fees paid to the lawyers are eye-watering the document is no joke but it seems coincidence that United Revenues and the Qatari proposal coming out on the same day I don't know about um where that there might be there's probably going to be deadlines on when these documents need to be released and it may well be this coincidence that it's on the same day but they, this is a document that they've been building for some time by the way some time um armania thank you very much dude gifted five memberships i need to get this dude's photo off my screen shake your scene i hope we never have to talk about you again sir um now there's something that happened yesterday which 
I find really strange. Okay, so this is this is from the Times yesterday. Um, saying the Glazers can force Jim Ratcliffe to sell Manchester United stake in 18 months. And again, there's been like a, um, there's been a bit of a strange reaction to that. Understandably so, because that's a serious headline. Like, what do you mean the Glazers can force Jim Ratcliffe to sell? And why is this article coming out yesterday? But it's just repeating a store, a part of the news that we've already spoken about and everybody kind of knew about already. Ratcliffe has sub formally submitted his tender offer to buy Manchester United, that's a legal document, to buy 25% of the shares for £1.3 billion. The tender document also has clauses laying down the rules on a future sale of the club. There are clauses that give Ratcliffe the opportunity to make the first offer, which is not what that headline says. Right? It's not what that headline says. Glazers can force Jim Ratcliffe to sell. The Glazers, well, Jim Ratcliffe has the ability to make the first offer, which is not what that headline suggests. That headline suggests that in 18 months, they can go, just, just bin him off, bin him off. and That's all right. He's, he's invested a little bit. Let's just bin off Ratcliffe. And that's just, from the Times, I'm surprised that they did that headline. I'm surprised that they, they did that headline because Ratcliffe has got that sort of, if the Glazers decide to sell, he has the ability to make the first offer. If someone else comes in and offers more and Jim Ratcliffe doesn't match it, well, that's a problem. But Jim Ratcliffe has pretty much the first offer. I think it's right. A first refu first, first refusal. I think it's called anyway. The Glazers can't just force him out in 18 months. That's a really strange headline from the Times. Uh, I'm surprised it. I'm surprised it's from them, really. That's why I wanted to pull that up, that, that bit up now. But yeah, as I said, there is so much more information in this document that I can't possibly cover it properly in this live show and interact with the comments at the same time. So I'm going to save quite a bit of it for the lunchtime video today. I'm going to pull up all the sort of the truths about Sheikh Jassim, about the bids, when the bids went in, how much the bids were, everything that they were asked to do and everything they didn't do. And also some facts and figures from the Ratcliffe takeover. And one important thing, which I will actually speak about now, is this. OK, so Christmas Eve, of course was when the um was when the takeover were well the the statement came out from Manchester United like 4 p.m on Christmas Eve I'm like you're jokers you're absolute jokers and it turns out this is why it happened it wasn't because the glazers had just been planning it the whole time and they were just doing it as supposed to inconvenience people it's because Ratcliffe went to them and said if you do not accept my offer by Christmas day I'm done I'm gone and I'm out. You do you. The Glazers then had an informal meeting on the 22nd of December, decided to agree it. And the statement came out on the 24th. It was Jim Ratcliffe properly threatening to pull out of the deal, which forced the, the final piece of movement which forced them to finally accept an offer. And again, it wouldn't, it's not the offer that any of us wanted. But given that the other, <laughs> the other choice was a Qatari bid, which was kind of in fantasy land, as far as we're concerned, it's kind of, after all of this has happened, I could have been Sheikh Jassim. I could have said to them, right, I'm going to give you Four point three billion pounds to buy Manchester United. Yours sincerely, Sam from United People's TV. That's kind of that's kind of all this Qatari bid was. It was nothing but a, a hot air and a sentence rather than anything of any real substance. But yeah, it was it was that oh wrong one. 
It was that Jim Ratcliffe um, threat, I suppose, which forced their hand. There's so much more that needs to be uh, said from this uh, from this document. I'm going to go down here and read a few of your comments. I want to see how spicy the comments are today. Um, did, did it, did it. George, the rat Ratcliffe cannot afford to buy the Glazers out anyway. They're his mates. Okay, I think I think a lot of um, a lot of United fans are are still so for some reason like personally stung and offended by the fact that we didn't become the latest state run club because they wanted the billions on billions on billions the player that they wanted it all right now as i said it's like what's the face i can't i can never remember her name violet from willy wonka i want it all and i want it now and that's why people were so um <laughs> someone's got to do a little family photo <laughs> oh, i might have to get that done today a little family photo of shake just seeing michael knight and and thomas ziliakis <laughs> in united shirts <laughs> somebody if anybody wants to whiz up that on photoshop that would be a funny that would be a funny photo uh but speaking that's funny we can laugh at it but just the, the more information that's coming out is it Veruca? Damn, Violet Veruca, whatever it is. Kind of, I can never remember her name. Must be Veruca. Anyway, it's the one who gets all the chocolate. I'm not laughing at this, right? Because I, it just it it makes it. This 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 number just makes you step back, doesn't it? The Rain Group. Have been paid Veruca Salt, right? I remember that now, right? The Rain Group were paid thirty-one point five million dollars to lead this whole process. Thirty-one point five million dollars. Right? I mean, it just makes you angry, doesn't it? Manchester United are going to be paying this $31.5 million. Not the Glazers. Now, if you do the... I did the maths yesterday. I think I was correct. The Glazers made £900 million from the sale of Manchester United from 25% of the club, right? That's how much Jim Ratcliffe paid to the Glazers directly. Now, 31, $31.5 million roughly works out to about £25 million. That means that from that £900 million, that there would be 2.7% of it. So if the Glazers paid that $31.5 million, that would only be 2.7% of what they got by selling part of the club. But no, Man United are going to be paying that money. At a time, right? At a time when we posted a £25.8 million loss in the first quarter of this year. At a time, right? Where is it? Where this, again, this, this is going to make you sick. At a time where our borrowings now overall have increased to just shy of 1.2 billion pounds. When you look at the debt, when you look at the interest that's paid on it, when you look at the overdrafts, when you look at money owed to other clubs, 364 million pounds we now owe to other clubs. I thought it was 300. It's 364. Like, people, I know you want a January signing. I know you do. But this is staggering. And at the time where all of that is happening, the Glazers still, they won't take a 2.7% percentage out of the money that they are getting directly. They are putting it on the club. 
at a time when all of these losses are happening, when our finances are in the pits. And you know what's worse? I hate to be the bearer of bad news here. You know what's worse? More is coming. Okay? This isn't even involved in it. I covered this the other day. Man United have got to pay a legal bill for 56 lawyers. Anybody down here work in the legal industry? <laughs> lawyers are expensive. One lawyer is very expensive. 56 lawyers. I've got no idea how much that's going to be. But that is going to be, as it's, as it's written there, it will run into the millions. I don't know how many millions, but it will be more millions. 56 of them. So that 31.5 million paid to the rain group, that's not even all of it. They're also going to be getting expenses reimbursed. We've also got to pay the whole legal bill. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. I, I, there, there's, there's more coming. Like that bit there. Where is it again? Oh, my God. It, Akash, it is eye watering. I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. It's if Man United are able to somehow sign a player on loan in January, I'll be happy. I'll be happy because there is no financial real possibility of Man United spending. And you know what? And this is a really important thing, right? Let me pull this up. Because so many people are asking, right? And they should be fairly asking. He goes, right, what does this mean for, for our sort of um, profit and sustainability rules? Nottingham Forest and Everton have both just been charged by breaching the rules. And the rules state that over a three-year accounting period, a club is allowed to show losses of 15 million. So basically, you can't spend more than your means. You can't have a revenue of 300 million and go and spend 700 million on signings. It's a correct thing to do. It is something that should have been in there in, in, in the Premier League before Chelsea came in, before City came in, and we would never have been in that position. But instead, they've gone, oh, actually... It's probably not a good idea just to let states buy clubs and just let them do what they want with them. Oh, damn it. So it, it, the horse has already bolted, but it's still necessary to do now. And this is the thing here, right? This is where it gets interesting and where we don't have an answer on this yet. But Manchester United, right, have posted a pre-tax loss of £32 million in the first quarter of this year. And that follows a combined pre-tax loss of £180 million over the last two campaigns, which means that our total currently for the three-year reporting period is a loss in excess of £200 million. We are way over. Right. This next, you might not like what's coming in these next couple of years, but it's coming. United need to sell. And I've said this before. I said it on the podcast with um, with Jim, actually, uh, the um, ripple effect on Spotify. Go and have a listen to that. I really could. um I can see Manchester United selling Marcus Rashford if a big bid comes in this summer. This is going to be a summer where Man United makes some big sales, right? Because that is how you affect this number the most. Uh, and you're, ask, you're asking about company credit cards. You're asking about... Uh, so debt doesn't get in, taken into account on FFP. Interestingly enough, that's what Kieran Maguire says. 
So maybe that's the smart way of Manchester United spending on the credit card. It's not quite involved. I, I don't quite know that. Overall, my point here, ladies and gents, like we are in a, a financial pickle, and that's to put it politely. And it's all thanks to the Glazers, the same Glazers that have now forced a $30 million cost onto our club. At a time when we are really sailing close to the wind, they put another 30 like they they do not give a shit they're putting us in a worse position so that they can gain an extra 2.7% of their overall 900 million they do not care and that right there is why i am happy that ratcliffe and enios have taken over the football operations away from that mindset Am I happy that the Glazers have somehow been allowed to keep their vice and their grip on Manchester United? No, absolutely not. But if it wasn't Ratcliffe, the Glazers would have just continued and waited. They would have waited it out until Manchester United was a carcass. It's bad. Our finances really are like bad. They are bad. Really, really bad. Machiavelli. Two packs in the comments. Uh, just catching up on this. So you're saying what the Glazers have released now is factual that someone richer than Newcastle couldn't show the funds to buy the club. That's the point. The whole way through this process, Machiavelli, Sheikh Jassim reiterated it's a private bid. Nothing to do with the Qataris. Absolutely nothing to do with the Emir of Qatar or all the billions and billions and billions of the state. We are a private company, 9-2 foundation, bring United back to the top, but they never proved the source of those funds, despite being asked multiple times. And I don't think they're richer than Newcastle. I'm pretty sure Newcastle are the richest in the world. They never proved it. They never proved that it was private money. There you go. Uh, yeah, man, I, I, well, I've got no idea what's coming up. Um, no idea what's coming up with um, Man United's finances, but that's a big... Honestly, I, I was going to mention this a little bit later in the show, but now it kind of feels appropriate, right? Because uh, James Ducker released this article yesterday saying Eric Ten Hag... Um, is adopting a more ruthless academy approach with another United exit. And he's talking about how Ten Hag wants to increase the standards of the players coming through rather than just letting every youth team player come through. And I think that's a, that's that's fair to a certain point, and I agree on that. However, truth be told, right, if Manchester United did not find ourselves in a position where we have liabilities, not just debt, it's liabilities. We owe debt, we owe overdraft payments, we owe amortization costs. It's all liabilities against us. If we don't owe 1.2 billion, then we're probably not going to be taking this approach as strongly to our academy players. But also at the same time, we do have to be like, honestly, right? We, we can speak about all the failures that we've had as a club when it comes to player signings. And there's plenty of them. But at the exact same time, one of the biggest failures that we've had is how poor we've been at selling at every level. Like Dan James is like the... Dan James is probably like the... Th the third highest, one of the highest profits we've ever made on a player. Certainly the last like 10, 15 years. We have to get significantly better at that. Now, Max Uyola Deli, by the way, good luck to him. He's gone on loan to Forest Green Rovers. Troy Deeney. I'm looking at that going. <sighs> not sure that's going to go well. Troy Deeney, I think this weekend had to come out and apologize for throwing all his players under the bus straight away. I don't see how Troy Deeney becomes a good manager. Let's see if I'm right or wrong. Uh, but good luck to Oya Daddy. At the very least, it'll be an experience. He's gone out on loan. Good luck to him. But 
Hannibal going to um, to Sevilla, it's pissed a lot of people off. But the structure of that deal, I think, twofold. It gives us the financial boost that will come from selling Hannibal at this moment in time. But we are protected over the next three years. If Hannibal becomes a very high-level, top, world-class player, fulfills his talent... We can buy him back for 35 million euros. And if he's sold on and we don't want to buy him back, we get 20% of that. That there is a smart business structure. And that's, I think, what we will be applying to a lot of academy players. Not all of them can come through Manchester United. You do have to cherry pick. But just make sure you don't leave sell yourself short if they do become successful elsewhere. Get your buyback clauses in. Get your sell-on percentages on. That, that's just smart, obvious. I mean, it's so obvious it hurts. It's so obvious it hurts. And then you've got Alvaro Fernandez who's part of that. And six million just seems ridiculous. Then I have to hope that Manchester United have got a much bigger percentage as a sell-on clause and have got a pretty low buyback clause. We don't know about those figures yet. Ahmad's not going anywhere. And kind of nor do I think he should, personally. And I know some, and I know you particularly disagree with that one. But I'm looking forward to seeing what Ahmad, I think from a technical, I, I look at technical qualities of players and I compare the technical qualities of Palistri and Ahmad and it's night and day, in my opinion, anyway. Akash, you're talking about clutching the straws. It's just that, that one there, it's not just about the ruthless approach, right? It's about the fact that financially we are, we're not in ruins, but we are staring into an abyss. Like Dave, Dave Brailsford and Ratcliffe coming in at this moment in time. It's, it's, it's like a, it's like throwing like a, a life ring. Like we need it. We're drowning as a club financially. Now, how much can Ratcliffe and Brailsford and Ineos actually do? They can reduce the cost of the football operations. Manchester United have got, I think, 1,200 staff. Brailsford has immediately said, well, we don't need that many staff. So they can reduce the costs in that. There is going to be a massive um, push for cost reduction at Manchester United. And people are going to be like, oh, uh, so pro Glazer. No, the Glazers are... It's not, man. Running a proper football operation is completely the opposite of the Glazers. We shouldn't have to be looking towards selling. Um, we shouldn't be having to look looking towards selling youth team players to prop up our spending. You're mad. We're united. But we really should not be looking anywhere near that. But we have to now. Because of the financial pit that we've been put into because of the glazers these glazers and we're forced into conversations and situations where we really really don't want to be and that's what the next the, the next year at, 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 at least is going to really be about housekeeping it's going to be about looking at the books seeing where it's, it's like for, if you ever get in the pri privileged position of being able to buy another business right? For whatever whatever you're doing, in whatever industry you're doing it in. If you ever get in that position, congratulations to you. You know what the first thing you're going to do when you take over that business? So you, you would have done your due diligence before buying said business, but when you go in there, you're going to be doing your housekeeping. You're going to be looking at all the costs of that business. You're going to be saying, what do we need? What do we not need? Well, that's that. Well, I don't think we need that. We'll take that out. That doesn't actually ruin any sort of efficiency of our business. Yeah, okay, we'll take that out. That saves us how much a month? Right, good. Okay, brilliant. Small wins all over the shop. Browser will be doing that from the football operations, making a football operation more sustainable. That's what this is all about. Somehow, Man United's finances are unsustainable right now. It just shouldn't be the case. As so much information came out yesterday, my head was kind of spinning. <laughs> Jonathan there with a humble brag in the comments. My house is too too big to housekeep. Well, I hope it, <laughs> I hope it's cold. You can be in a big cold house. I don't know how it's cold. But if you've got a big house, fair play. I can't wait to get a house. I'm bored living in a flat. Tell you that. JC. My, oh, wow. JC. Thank you very much, dude. 
And look, as I said, let me just quickly give that. That's getting a decent gong. Can you hear that? Anyway. I, I don't particularly like digging out. Oh, beefing, all that shit. But I had to do it today. Um, okay, that's a lie. I didn't have to do it. I really, really wanted to do it because I'm working so hard myself on making the right content, on hopefully helping to educate United fans into thinking in the right, not thinking in the right way, but taking everything into account, facts and information. And just to, to call a legal document spin, it's pure talk sport, son, nonsense. Nonsense. You may as well go on a podcast with Joey Barton, mate. Yeah, that's why I did that. Ah, oh, Tom, Tommy Ledge. Five gifted memberships for you as well. <laughs> Akash, you're saying, when is the shop going to be live? Um, I'm aiming for, this, is, this isn't a promise, by the way. The amount of promises I've missed, you may as well call me Shake the Seam. But I'm hoping to have the shop launched by the start of March, the 1st of March. Um, by the 1st of February is when I hope for this, the live show to be completely relaunched. And mate, when that relaunches, there's going to be live Discord call-ins for members in these morning live shows. There's going to be so much more engagement. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Mazid, you're saying, Sam, what about the website? The website, the website, website? Website got pushed to the side a little bit because we launched Discord. I think Discord does a lot from a community perspective of what I wanted the website to do. Mate, it was me. It was Alex. Big up, Alex. It was Stu. Uh, there was a couple of more as well. Um, there were some awesome people involved in helping. There really, really were. I wonder if I can show you. Oh, man, I was so excited to launch this one. I might show you a little bit of merch. Should I show you a bit, a little bit of merch? A design I had? Oh, which one? Hmm. I've got all the designs here that no one's seen yet. This one was class. Let me let me pull this one up. Where is it? Hmm. Let's pull this one up. Can I open that? How do you open that? Let's pull this one up then. All right, coming in. Let's sod it. So I've been sitting on this for... I mean, sod knows how long, actually. Sod knows how long. This one is a design for... One second here. Just want to get it right. How do you change the color? Can't really see that. This was a design we made for a certain Rasmus Hoyland. Oh, actually, shouldn't do that. See if anyone's going to go on it. Ah, balls. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I feel like Hagrid. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Wait right there, I've got an idea. Sorry, I'm taking too long here, I know. All right, one sec. I'm nearly ready now, nearly ready. So this was the design that we made for Rasmus Hoyland. And the big thing that I'm going to be doing for the... Um, big thing that I'm going to be doing for the merch this next time when I relaunch it. You know, in the same way that I'm really got a big emphasis on the quality of the videos that we're doing like yesterday i'll speak about the carrington video yesterday but that video right there is is like an ideal lunchtime video in my opinion for what i want it's about raising the quality and raising the bar now this one is going to be kind of a low quality image but this was the design that we've got for rasmus hoyland so we emphasized on the um i love the i don't know what if there's anybody in the comments from uh, from Denmark or Scandinavia. What's the name of that zit, that O, with the, through the middle of it? I thought it was really, really cool. 
So I thought it would be nice to just make a design just based on that. So I think in itself, on its own, it looks really, really cool. So there's, there's Rasmus written on the side of it, to like a little signature. Um, I, not everyone's going to love it. I know that. But I, I want to try and do sort of an emphasis on stuff that kind of looks a bit fashionable. If you know what I mean. Not just football merch that you can go and buy from Trevor next to the football stadium with like puns and stuff on it. I'm, I can't wait to launch this merch. I really, really can't. Um, and there's going to be some really, really cool stuff. We're talking, we're talking embroidered logos on certain shirts, maybe some embroidered members only merchandise. There's, there's some really, really cool stuff that's going to be coming. I can't wait to do it. Um, but yeah, it, it, if we're looking at the time frame right now, we've got a big emphasis on increasing the quality of the videos. So for example, that little video yesterday I did on the Carrington, I quite enjoyed doing the research on that. Actually, I, was, I thought it was really funny that I found out that Leicester's new training ground was built on an old golf course and Manchester United this week have been looking at golf courses and the person who was in the director of infrastructure at Leicester at the time that they built that new training ground is now Manchester United's director of infrastructure. So you can see the, the synergy and the links between the two. Yeah, mate, Carrington is the, the ground at Carrington is very swampy. Kind of, that's been talked about quite a lot. And it's not that it floods a lot, but like the, the surrounding areas, it's quite saturated land. And I think that's why Leicester looked at golf courses because golf courses have great drainage. It's part of being a golf course, isn't it? You need good drainage so you can play golf properly. So therefore, the ground itself is really well looked after. And I think that's kind of why Leicester went to look at a golf course. They've also got a bloody nine-hole golf course at their training ground. <laughs> Imagine that. Just bowling into work and you go, I oh, should, should go play the golf course over there. Um, so if you'd like to go and watch that video on Carrington, it's pretty cool, I think. So anyway, some information in there. So, <laughs> there's a couple of uh, super chats I think I might have missed. Let me go down here and read some of these out. Miles is saying, Sam, is there a time limit for Sir Jim to buy the club? There's no limit, Miles. There's no really anything on the full takeover. There's the drag along, which is what the that report is. That's so Ratcliffe could get dragged into a full sale if the Glazers weren't down that path. Uh, but that's a real sort of misleading headline. Um, Mark, this club will be gutted by Ineos pawnbrokers. I mean, I'm, how can this club be any more gutted than what the Glazers have done in f siphoning over a billion out of our club on interest repayments and debt? on there still being a north of 500 million pounds debt on currently our current liabilities being 1.2 billion we're talking in the billions that the glazers have siphoned away from our football club i think that damage is done steve <laughs> stop teasing release the merch something that i might be able to do actually and this 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 might be a cool thing actually maybe we'll be able to do a uh, sort of pre-orders ahead of the launch in march just so everybody can, if you get, if you if you want to, if you want to support them. As I said, all of this is all going to be geared towards helping United People's TV do bigger and better things. Like the merch is getting done, we can bring in more designers, we can bring in more people to work with the videos, bring in more video editors. It's just, it's all self-serving. That's pretty cool, actually. Really. Right. Last, I've been not waffling, but there's been a lot to talk about today. I want to speak about this to to finish the show. Right. Anthony Martial. You say. Um, <laughs> Anthony Martial. I checked out of the Anthony Martial gang. Kind of a while ago now. Uh, and I felt with fair and justified reason. Because I just like the, the same sort of. Same sort of thing happens like time and time again. Uh, so this feels like a... This feels almost like a bit of a fitting end. 
but at the same time, quite a sad one. So this is Chris Wheeler, isn't it? Yeah, no, Matt Hughes, sorry, from the Daily Mail, uh, reporting that Anthony Martial is, has been asked to train on his own to regain fitness. quick look at Anthony Martial's injury his list and injury history here is um man every single it part of it is probably just his body not being resilient enough to the demands and the rigors of the Premier League I reckon that's part of it and part of it will be his approach oh, I'm not quite fit enough oh, I'm not I'm not I'm I'm only at like 94% fitness. I I don't want to risk it. And if you play like that in the in the modern Premier League, it's, you probably will never play. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and and say I'm delighted and happy about this. Cuz I'm not I'm not I'm not going to revel in the downfall of Martial. I think it's genuinely quite sad. But like it's over, man. It's over before it's over. This is this is this is one hell of a long goodbye with Anthony Martial. When he leaves the club in the summer for a free transfer, we're like, I swear on my life that could have happened like three years ago. And like, like it wouldn't, like nothing really would have happened. It, it wouldn't have been that bad. There wouldn't really be much difference. And this is the like the absolute epitome of an example of a player that Manchester United have kept for too long. And the reason we kept him for too long is because we gave him a bumper contract. Since then, he's never, well, it's not just since then, but it, he's never ever warranted that contract. We can't sell him. Nobody wants to pay the wages. So he stayed at the club. And you know what's really, like, I think probably one of the most frustrating things about Martial is in Eric Ten Hag's two pre-seasons at the club, I would have put him in the best performers both times. I actually probably would set up, I probably would have put Sancho in both of those as well. Like the early promise always sucks you in with Anthony Martial and it never delivers. I hope they can go elsewhere and enjoy a good career, but my God, it's just like, as I said, this is the, the longest of goodbyes. Really is. And it's, it's quite sad in the way it's come down here, but it's he should be training. If he's not fit enough, he should be training on his own. Eric Ten Hag, man management, this and that, like, get in the bin. All right. Again, like you can get in the bin if if you about the Sancho stuff as well, in my opinion. I would never look, I will never be able to oversee the fact that he gave him three months off mid-season and there was no response as a consequence. How can you possibly be surprised if after that point? you get called out for not training properly. Like it staggers, it, it, stagger, it staggers belief. Staggers belief? Beggars belief. And Martial, hey, dude, dude did this as a sick note, right? If he's not fit, don't train with the first team. And this is at a time, by the way, where Eric Ten Hag has absolutely, he's got Hoyland. He's got one striker at the club. And he's asking Martial to train on his own. He's not doing this because he's not doing this because he wants to. He's doing this because he has to. <laughs> Deary me, Martial. Well, that was um. Well, actually, look at that, Michael. Michael, you ledge. Thank you very much, dude. Gift him five memberships. All smiles. Happy faces all around. <laughs> Happy feelings all around. <laughs> Any old school Ball Street uh, <laughs> followers will remember that one. But um, strange show, show really. Me sort of digging out. It's the reason that I dig out. I'm, I'm just explaining to you the honest truth. Is because I'm working and I'm committing so much of my time and my life to running this properly this isn't no this isn't like a side hustle that i'm constantly thinking about united people's tv and what i'm doing and presenting myself properly 
and I'm trying to hopefully influence United fans in the right way, critical thinking, thinking about the right things, talking about the right things. And if there's somebody out there with a much bigger audience that's undermining what I am putting so much effort into, I'm going to call them out. And that's the reason I did it. All right? <laughs> See me skimmed it. Kind of depressed after the show. <laughs> well, you laugh. Well, you shouldn't really laugh. I'm going to be doing uh, one more video today at lunchtime, which is, there's, there is, as I said, there is a lot more detail that I haven't been able to mention in this show because it's just a bit too complicated. I'm going to, I'm going to get through it. I'll be able to get through it in a nice tight 10 minute video at lunchtime today, but I can't. We would have been talking for about two hours here. I'm going to do one video on lunchtime today. It's like the, the full truth about the Jasim bid, about the Ratcliffe offers, about everything that went on behind the scenes. 14 months of takeovers are going to be wrapped up into a 10 minute video. And then we can draw a line in the sand and then we can again start thinking because this week we've been looking ahead towards we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about Ratcliffe's meeting with the fan representatives. I'm going to have a video out on Friday, which has far more information and detail about what exactly was said, even more information. I'm looking forward to it. But big up to you as a community, as always, best in the world. Make sure you go over to the Discord. Did I leave the Discord link down there? There you go. Everybody join in. There's another 30 or so of you that can come in there and join the members chat. If you have any problems, I feel bad for you. No, look, if you have any problems, go on there, speak to Joe, speak to the other mods. They will help you connect your YouTube account to your Discord. Makes it 10 times easier. All right. Much love to all of you. Check out the lunchtime video today. I'll speak to you soon.